Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor. We're going to give people a little bit more time to join the room for now, but while they do, I'll let you know a bit about the platform that we've chosen to use and how you can use that to speak to our guests today, to ask them questions and to generally interact with the webinar itself. So you may have used this before, there's been a lot of webinars this year, but this is GoToWebinar and uh, you can, for a start, uh, you may be enjoying seeing my face but maybe you're on a slower connection somewhere and you'd like to make use of all of your broadband to see the presentation and hear our speakers talking in which case there should be a little button above my head that you can use to turn on or off the webcams i won't be at all offended if you choose to shut down my face so do feel free to do that if you're on a slower connection the other really important thing about GoToWebinar is that you can use it to ask questions. So down at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel, which by default will be on the right hand side of your screen, you should find a box there that you can use to send messages and questions to myself, to our speakers and to the Chemistry World team who are helping to make this happen today. That's Chris and Francis. So any questions you have at any point throughout the webinar, just get them into that questions box at the bottom. If they're questions about the topic, we will put them to our speakers at the end of the presentations. If they're questions about the webinars themselves, then one of my colleagues will be happy to answer that for you. Now also, in a couple of days time, we will send you a link to the recording of this webinar. Now it may be that you just want to watch something else again, maybe you arrive late or have to leave early, don't worry, the whole thing will be recorded and you'll be able to watch that again whenever you like to with from that link in your email, so keep an eye out for that in a few days time. The other thing we will send to everybody who attends the broadcast live is a certificate to say thank you. So keep an eye out for that as well. There should be a PDF attachment in that with a certificate of attendance saying that you attended this webinar. That's just our way of saying thanks. So there are still a few people coming in, but I think we should move on and approach the topic of today's webinar. So today we're going to learn about advanced catalyst materials characterization using the state-of-the-art thermoscientific Spectra 200 S10. As you can see on the screen, we described that as a workhorse for catalyst characterization. I should add, thermoscientific are our uh, sponsor and they've supported us for this webinar. They've been fantastic in finding not only an interesting topic to cover, a really good angle on it, and then finding the right people who uh, use these things in the wild they know how to talk about them they know what they can do and they know why they're so useful to you uh, as the chemistry community so thank you huge thank you to thermo fisher scientific for uh, working with us to put this webinar together a catalyst, as I'm sure you know, are essential in almost all walks of chemistry and advances in analytical capabilities of TEM over the last decade have fueled a new era of catalyst research. Modern TEMs are no longer a niche tool for fundamental research in the catalysis industry, but are necessary equipment for product development, production support, and importantly, for patenting efforts. So over the course of this webinar, we're going to discuss several cases of how such analytical instruments are used and we'll present the state-of-the-art thermoscientific Spectra 200S slash TEM that has just been installed at Haldotopso AS. So over the course of the next hour, we'll learn how advanced catalyst characterization is done using methods like TEM. Uh, we will look at how tools like the Spectra 200S slash TEM are used in the catalyst industry and why Haldotopso chooses the Spectra 200S TEM. We have three guests with us today, two are giving presentations and then we're delighted to be joined by a third guest who's going to help us go through all of your questions. So the presentations will be from Ram Tiruvallam and Anil Nyalchen. Uh, let me tell you a bit more about them. There's still a few people coming in, so it's still a good time to talk. Uh, so Ram Tiruvallam is a principal research scientist at Haldor Topso AS. He holds a PhD in material scientist and, and, and in engineering uh, from Lehigh University, currently responsible for the analytical TEM facility at how we'll top set. Uh, Anil then will speak after Ram. Uh, he's working in product marketing with a focus on material science TEM offerings in EMEA. Uh, holds a PhD in in-situ TEM applications from Delft University. And then we'll be joined for the Q&A bit by Dr. Min Wu, who works as a business development manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific, focusing on chemistry, catalysis, and polymer EM applications and solutions. She also holds a PhD, uh, this one in material science from the University of Oxford. We're delighted to be joined by all three of them and thank you so much for giving your time today.
Uh, that's probably all from me, but before I hand over to Ram for the first presentation, we'd like to get to know a bit more about you as an audience and your own experience with the sorts of techniques we're going to talk about today. So what we'll do now is we'll get a poll up on screen and we just want you to uh, want you to answer that one. I'm not sure that's exactly the poll we wanted to start with, so we might come back to that one a bit later on. Uh, so instead, let's run the other poll there we go uh, so what microscopy techniques are you using today let's uh, if you can let us know it gives us a really good idea of who the audience is what you find most useful it will help ram and anil to uh, to tailor their presentation it'll also help us to know which are the most useful questions to answer in the questions bit at the end of the presentation when we're joined by dr min wu uh, so we'll give you a couple more minutes or a minute or so just to make sure everybody votes and while i've got got you clicking on the screen now is a great time to check that you know where that questions box is so as soon as any questions occur to you you can just drop them into that questions box at the bottom of the go to webinar panel and we'll be able to put them to our speakers uh, that is near enough but probably about enough time so uh, let's close that down now and we'll have a look and see so most of you uh, almost 60% are SEM users, scanning electron microscope users, uh, but there is a decent mix of other other techniques in use from our audience today. So uh, TM as well is doing very well at 47%, and 31 are using other techniques as well. XPS and FibSEM or FIBSEM, SDB, uh, it's slightly lower represented, but still 10% of the audience there. So it's a good diverse range of the sorts of mic microscopy techniques that are currently in use across the chemical sciences. So thank you very much. We'll close those results down now. Uh, there will be another poll later on. You've already seen a sneak preview of that, so we'll try and make sure that comes up later on uh, to find out a bit more about you as an audience. But that is more than enough from me. Do keep your questions coming in. Thank you again for joining us. I'll hand over now to Ram. So let's uh, get Ram on screen and uh, get his presentation up. Ram, thank you ever so much for joining us. So we can see you, but we can't yet see your presentation. Just Not a second. I'm complaining, of course. There you go. And there we go. We've got the presentation as well. Thank you again for joining us. I shall step back and leave you to it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining today's presentation. Um, and I thought uh, we just had a Spectra 200 installed, so I don't have any exciting results from the Spectra yet. Uh, but I thought I would give this presentation to give you an idea on how an analytical TEM is used in the industry. Uh, if you are in that phase of your life where you're trying to choose a career, uh, this will help you uh, see if microscopy in the industry is the right path for you or not. And, and in general, it'll give you an idea of what, how we use these instruments in industry. And uh, if you are in the industry and are thinking about, should I go for an aberration character TEM or should I go for the spectra? Should I go for Talos? Should I go for something else? This might also give you a little bit of an idea on uh, what to invest in. So with, uh, with that, let's, uh, let's just move into the presentation. Uh, uh, what I've chosen for for the slide that you're watching is the actual picture of a catalyst pellet, which is the way we ship to our customers. It's usually a few centimeters in size, and and you accompanying you also see an uh, atomic resolution image showing uh, the different phases uh, in this catalyst. So let's just move ahead, and just a second. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, who, what, and why? Uh, Hildeb Topso is a global leader in catalysis. So, we supply catalysis process technology uh, within chemical processing, hydroprocessing, and emissions management. We are located in uh, in Denmark, in uh, in Lungbu, which is close to Copenhagen, uh, the city of Copenhagen, where most of our head, uh, facilities are. But otherwise, we are a worldwide company. Um, sorry. And um, so with 2020, we have a very exciting uh, new vision for our company with a new redefined purpose and a redefined vision. And our purpose is to perfect chemistry for a better world. And our vision is to be recognized as a global leader in carbon emission reduction technologies by 2024, which is extremely ambitious. And if you at some point would like to join us in contributing to this effort, keep a lookout on the jobs page, try to apply and join the journey really. So 
why am I giving this presentation? So we have just installed a Spectre 200 and uh, and what we think it give it will give us is an unparalleled fundamental analysis capability because uh, we have installed a probe character and uh, and the resolution is absolutely spectacular in this instrument uh, we want to give a very fast response uh, to all the projects in in the research and development and uh, the spectra can do that um, we can have a very large capacity for analysis, uh, which means we can have a higher throughput of samples, and we have a dual X installed uh, for the EDS, and uh, and and both the aberration character and the dual X means we will get a very high quality of analysis uh, as well. And uh, this this all this is for the research and development and patenting which is very important uh, for a company like ours. And, and throughout our presentation, I'll give you some examples to give you an idea on how we use uh, some specific examples on how, spec, how microscopes have been useful so far. So with that, how is ATEM used in the industry? Now, before we, before we understand how it's used in the industry, it's very important to understand the scale of things when you, when you, uh, when you want to understand how you are going to improve the catalyst, the first thing you look at is a plant uh, on all the way to your uh, to your right, uh, which is several uh, tens of uh, meters in size, and then reactors, which is a couple of meters in size, which is filled up with pellets, catalyst pellets, which are a few centimeters in size. That in turn is actually made from a powder. Uh, which is comprised of particles, and the particles are comprised of very small single crystals that are a few tens of nanometers in size. And then the active site where the reaction happens, where the molecules anchor, where they react, is is a is probably a couple of angstroms in size. And um, and and it's like comparing golf balls to the size of the Earth, which is which is you can imagine that the scale that everything we do at the scale of these angstroms really contribute to millions in, in, uh, in, in production capabilities for a plant. Uh, so with that, uh, just an introduction to Topsus microscope facility. We have several li advanced light optical microscopes. Uh, we have three SEMs and one electron microprobe we have an analytical TEM, which is the Spectra 200, and we have an image corrected Titan uh, in situ microscope, uh, which was installed in 2008. And uh, now uh, the the person who was solely responsible for this uh, magnificent instrument uh, has moved uh, to DTU, uh, and we have chose to partner with DTU to build the next generation uh, uh, institute microscopes, which will be uh, called a vision project. And uh, and uh, if you want to know more about that, you can go to the web page of vision at DTU and find out more about that. Um, and so let's, uh, just to give you a general introduction to how a catalyst is developed. Uh, so this is what is, uh, is called a catalyst development pipeline. And you can see the different gates which uh, which a catalyst must go through before it is launched so first you start with an idea or a scope so so typically your customer contacts you and says i would like a catalyst for this and this reaction so you look through your portfolio you look through the literature you develop some uh, catalyst candidates and you do an r d lab scale development and then, which is one of your candidates gets selected, okay, this is the most promising, then you go to a larger scale, make a few hundred kilos, do your pilot test, make sure that it works, then it goes to production in the plant, uh, then it is sent to the first customers, and the feedback from the customers is used to improve the product a little more, and then the final catalyst is launched. So if you look at where the TM is used in all these, uh, in these different steps, the first step really is where a lot of DFT is involved, a lot of literature search, a lot of looking at the portfolio uh, where we are trying to define the catalyst. Um, 
and then we start making a few candidates and uh, and testing them and that is where an analytical tm is extremely useful because you're cycling through probably one to two recipes a week uh, at this stage depending on the reaction uh, and you need very fast feedback there to be able to see if the alloying elements that you've put in are where they should be and why a catalyst is working why it's not once you have scaled it up to a certain scale, then you are trying to finalize the recipe. You're trying to finalize, let's say, the catalyst drying procedures. You're trying to finalize how you're making your slurry and so on. That's the second phase where an ATEM is used. And the last is when the catalyst is launched, you really don't have much need for it, except when you want to uh, look at customer samples from the first customer run, see if it has performed according to specification or not. And then that information is used to develop the next generation of the catalyst. So the cycle continues. So it's design, synthesis, test, and then the loop goes on. So it is the smallest things that make the biggest difference. So everything that you can contribute with your TEM research will go up and make uh, make a make a lot of money for your customers and your products and also make the difference for the world that you hope for so until now we had been using uh, two different microscopes at universities uh, the first was the talus at Aarhus University which we primarily use for EDS mapping and tomography uh, and all our basic research and we have also access to an aberration corrected uh, stem at DTU, uh, which is an old uh, generation stem with a with now an SDD detector, an XMAX SDD detector, uh, but uh, it is not very good performance for EDS that that we can use it uh, as the talus. So we primarily use it for looking at single atoms and for looking taking some yield spectra because it's a monochromated instrument. And the spectra is a, hits the spe sweet spot between these two because it's a cold FEG that we have chosen. So we don't need a monochromator. It is probe corrected, so we can still look at single atoms. And then we have dual X, which can give us the ultimate speed for EDS mapping. So we sort of chose the best of both worlds in ordering the spectra 200. And sorry. So, why did we choose the dual x typically when we are trying to make new materials uh, we would like to see how the phases are distributed and the example that you see is a is a is a sample that a student made when we were trying to develop some novel magnetic materials so we had a calcine mix of iron zinc nickel and strontium oxides and what the xrd analysis showed was that we had a spinel phase with iron, nickel, and zinc, and uh, and we had a strontium ferrite uh, phase. And then they also reported that there was another phase which they couldn't really identify. Now, this XRD analysis, which is the bread and butter uh, analysis for, for the industry, gives us quick input, but it doesn't really tell you how the phases are distributed. And so for that, we need something like the CEM, where you can see how the two different phases are distributed. And what we see here is that there has been some sort of a contamination in the student sample. We also see, uh, which has strontium and molybdenum in the material. So with a very quick map, which about takes 10 minutes, you can sort of resolve how the different phases are present in this material. So this is how we use uh, EDS mapping uh, in our company. So with that, let's move to some specific examples. Um, so the first example I would like to present is is a, is a noble metal promoted autothermal reforming catalyst. So in in autothermal reforming, what happens is you're trying to convert a natural gas to a mixture of CO2, CO, and hydrogen. So basically, you're trying to produce hydrogen. So you first, what you do is you burn the natural gas to generate some heat, um, and then once you start burning it, then there is an endothermic zone where you have a bunch of catalysts. And what the catalyst does is that it takes the remaining natural gas and the steam and converts it into CO and hydrogen, which is typically called synthesis gas. And it can be used for the generation of further materials. So you can make gasoline out of it. You can make uh, 
uh, methanol out of it so you can make further products from the mixture of CO and hydrogen. So once you have CO and hydrogen, you can pretty much make uh, do a lot of chemistry from it. Um, and the problem that we faced was at the top of this reactor, it's extremely hot. So all the nickel that was present in this catalyst started evaporating and all the alumina that it was supported on started converting into rubies. Uh, now rubies are something we like, but not in a reactor. So, so the ideal thing was somehow to add uh, some sort of alloying element to, to make the activity higher that would reduce the temperature of the bed at the top of this uh, catalyst bed, and then it will stop uh, ruby formation. So we had a CM200 at the time, so we started doing some maps. So we tried iridium, rhodium, and ruthenium. And what you see at the top, uh, middle, and bottom are the distributions taken with the CM200 of nickel and iridium and a combination of the two, nickel, rhodium, and a combination of the two, and nickel, uh, ruthenium, and a combination of the two. So you can see that at this stage, you have two different phases, two different nanoparticles, and the expectation was that as the reaction proceeds, the nickel will move around, it will be sort of captured by these noble metal rich particles, and then you will form alloys. Great, and that does happen. So now you, if you look at the age catalyst, you formed with iridium and rhodium, you formed uniform alloys across uh, the board, whereas in ruthenium, you sort of form these biphased particles, um, where, because the miscibility between nickel and ruthenium is not so good. Um, so each of these maps at that time took me eight hours. So I was running the microscope overnight to get this sort of an input. And when we move uh, to a super X detection system, what took me eight hours takes me less than 10 minutes to get an idea of how my nickel and iridium is distributed. So on, on, on to your left, you see nickel and iridium with the iridium in green and the nickel in red in the fresh catalyst. And in the age catalyst, you see that all the particles are alloyed. And not only that, that there is a composition uh, variation with respect to the size, with the larger having more nickel and the smaller having more iridium. And this is expected when nickel is the one that is moving around. Um, so that is how uh, Super X really changed uh, the game here from going from a silly detector. And the example two is in the same system, we, we developed a new catalyst, a little bit lower in the bed, which has a new support. And the support was calcium aluminate uh, at, at the middle or, or the bottom of the, of, the, of the reactor. And what we found was that depending on the phases you have in the calcium aluminate, the activity varied. And what you're seeing in the graph is, is the percentage of a phase called hibonite in the carrier. And the more the hibonite, the more the relative reforming activity. Great. So we could see that if we could process the calcium aluminate in such a way that there was more hibonite in the carrier, we got a very, very good catalyst. And we can see the SEM picture showing the small nickel particles on top of the hibonite structure. What we could see was that we had higher nickel active sites and we had the absence of free calcium oxide in these catalysts. Now, Let's look at the TEM results to get some fundamental insight into what is happening. So what you see onto your left is a nickel particle with the, on a grossite carrier. And it looks like the nickel particle is sort of covered with something. And onto your right, you see a nickel particle on a hibonite carrier. So the nickel particle on the grossite carrier is not fully reduced. And it seems like there is some sort of oxidic layer along with nickel. And on the on the hibonite carrier, it is completely reduced and, and you can see that the surface is free. So when you do eels, which is the go-to technique here, uh, to make sure uh, what you have on the surface is exactly coming from the same region that you're mapping, uh, what you see is that it is covered by calcium. So all the free calcium that moves in the grossite carrier has covered the nanoparticle. So even though your XRD might measure that you have the nanoparticles, the surface of these particles is not accessible. 
And so you have a passivating overlayer on top, which makes the nickel surface non-accessible. And so you have restricted access. Whereas on a Hibonite carrier, you have free access. And this is how you can combine research from your institute CEM with mapping from an atom uh, and, and, and they really understand what is going on in, in your catalyst. The next example I would like to give you is, uh, is how we develop battery materials. And if you want details on it, there is a very nice white paper that is published on our homepage, and I would really urge you to go and read it. But a short version is that um, when you're trying to make uh, LNMO, uh, what is more important is the phase purity. So, so when you're trying to make this, your conditions have to be perfectly right. And, and you see, um, I, I've shown you two examples, one of a very pure phase material where there's a uniform distribution and one where it is not so well made, where you have unwanted phases. So you can actually try to find out recipes for synthesis that can give you this uniform distribution. And so what you can see is that you take the region where you have these two phases, you can do your EDS map, and then you can measure how much nickel and manganese is present on these carriers. And with that, you can actually see if it compares with your a nickel that is predicted by electrochemistry. So in these battery materials, when you measure with electrochemistry, you can actually predict uh, how much nickel is present. And what we could see was that if you could measure in the bulk of the catalyst, nickel uh, as 0.45 and manganese as 1.55, it was very close to the one that is predicted with electrochemistry. So that meant that the rock salt phase uh, is not contributing anything and it's just a waste and has to be avoided. Um, so this is how we used analytical CEM to, to develop this material, and it has also been used for the protection of IP in patents and so on. Uh, so the next example is when we get samples from customers. And what typically uh, we face is that sometimes the customer samples have some carbon growth that is destroying the, the catalyst performance. And, uh, and this carbon, this could be growing from uh, either the catalyst, which has been run at wrong conditions, or it could be coming from the pipes. And what we see here is within 10 minutes, we have resolved the issue. We can see that the carbon whiskers or the nanotubes are growing from an iron particle, which means that it actually came from the pipes as this catalyst doesn't have any iron. So basically what is happening is when you have carbon rich gas mixtures, they're picking up some iron along the way, they're stripping iron off the pipes and then depositing onto the catalyst, which are forming these whiskers. So we can give these feedback to our customers saying, hey, you have to mix something with your gases to make sure that this is not happening. So onto the next slide. Uh, this example, we show how we use tomography. Uh, what you see on the top is, uh, tom uh, is uh, tomography reconstructions from a fresh catalyst. And we can actually measure the porosity uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the support and, and how the pores are connected. Uh, and you can see what happens when they are aged and how the pores changed by aging. So with that, you can actually see how the catalyst is getting affected by the aging process. And, um, and then we have uh, European regulations where we need to report the size of the particles and the shape of the particles of a catalyst. And TEM is, is one of the best techniques to do it. So you take images and then you give report to the authorities showing, okay, this is if you have nickel oxide in a catalyst, if you have alumina in a catalyst, this is the size of the nickel oxide, this is the size and shape of alumina in a catalyst, which is a very important part also for companies to document its products and, and make sure they are uh, compliant with all the regulations. So I haven't covered all the other ways we use it. I haven't covered cryo microscopy, I haven't covered electron diffraction, but really we can go on. It really, an ATEM for us is like a Swiss knife uh, and, and we use almost every feature of it. And, uh, and, and the best compromise we found was in the Spectra 200 and that's why we got it. And uh, it was installed uh, mid-October. We are starting to use it 
and uh, I can only recommend it. It's a fantastic instrument. And uh, Anil will present uh, after me on the best features of this instrument. And with that, I have to say thank you. Thank you very much, Ram. Thank you for joining us. We will hand over to Anil in just a sec. Just a little reminder, especially to everybody who joined us late, we'll send you a copy of the recording of this presentation. We don't share the slides because we feel that the important thing is the slides in the context of what's being said, but you can watch the recording at any point. So if there's anything you missed or anything you'd just like to go over again, keep an eye out in your inbox for a link to that recording shortly. Uh, but thank you again, Ram. We will uh, be joined by Ram again later for the Q&A session today, but now we'll hand over to Anil. So let's just get Anil Lianchen on screen and we'll see his presentation as well. Once again, do get any questions you have at any point throughout the presentation, uh, get them into that questions box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, Anil, we can see your presentation. We can't yet see your lovely face though. So if you wouldn't mind uh, switching your webcam on, then we can see who we're hearing. Excellent. Thank you once again for joining us, Anil. I shall step back and leave you to it. Thanks a lot, Ben and Ram. And um, as Ram mentioned, I will be talking about basically what we have under the enclosure for Spectra 200. Um, so I will first start with the platform overview because we have basically two platforms in the Spectra. We have Spectra 200 and 300. I will briefly mention that and then the, the, the imaging performance and analytical performance of Spectra 200. Following that, what provides these imaging and analytical performances? Mainly uh, extra brightness cold fact, S-core crop corrector, Pantel stem detectors, IDPC stem image formation technique, and EDS detector offerings that we have on uh, Spectre 200. And after that, we will have questions and answers session. So uh, with the Spectre, we basically have two offerings. The first one is on the left, you see Spectre 200, which comes uh, up to 200 kV. And we mainly uh, use this platform for high throughput for I mean, all applications, particularly focusing on STEM and EDS. And we have also Spectra 300, and it can go up to 300 kV. Uh, and for this platform, we have two different uh, electron source offerings. So we can, uh, it can be uh, extra brightness cold pack, but we can also offer extract mono uh, option for monochromated applications. And uh, Spectre 300 is mainly for highest resolution for all applications because it also delivers your 300 kV capability. So this, uh, for this webinar, we are mainly focusing on Spectre 200. And what we have is ultra high brightness, uh, ultra high brightness cold pack. S-core probe corrector, Pantel stem detectors, IDP system, and in terms of EDS offerings, DualX and SuperX. What do we get uh, with the probe corrected stem imaging on Spectra 200? Well, we can go down to 60 picometer at 200 kV. In principle, we can go better, but the official number is 60 picometer, and the uh, sub angstrom resolution still at 60 kV. And it's also important to keep in mind that this platform is uh, with uh, the extra brightness cold fact so that you don't need to deal with monochromator, you don't need to excite it um, to, to get good imaging capabilities uh, for low KV uh, applications. And also the advantage of having cold fact is that um, because of its intrinsic brightness, we can really specify uh, at least 100 picoampere probe current at these specified resolutions. And yeah, the, 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 these imaging performances are uh, thanks to basically extra brightness call pack and as well as probe corrector that we have. If we go to analytics, so elemental studies, um, you see here the EDS map uh, acquired on uh, Spectra 200. And uh, the maps basically are unfiltered and they deliver us a uh, sub angstrom resolution in the Fourier transform. So this is actually quite new that, uh, that we came up with with the spectra. And this is again thanks to uh, intrinsic brightness of a cold fact of uh, S-core probe corrector as well as the EDS detection system 
Uh, as Van mentioned, it is possible with the dual X. It's also possible with the super X. And uh, the, this specimen is coming from the Cornell University, so it's, 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 it's good to acknowledge them here as well. If we look at the, the cold fact, uh, the advantage, the, basically the idea of cold fact is that you can have a good uh, narrow energy spread, which uh, you see here uh, less than 0.4 EV. And at the same time, you have very high current, uh, around 500 picoampere, and the probe size is very small. So basically, uh, the probe size and the probe current, so high probe current and small probe size within that current, tells us that we have a good, actually very good intrinsic brightness. And at the same time, we can achieve very good energy spread. Um, as all cold facts, um, the, the the, the, the probe current can decrease slightly in time, but uh, what we see with our extra brightness cold fact is that um, up to five hours, the decrease is uh, quite less, which means that you don't have to do uh, too frequent uh, flashing. And while talking to flashing, basically we have a movie, which I will start soon. Uh, what we have here is that um, we have a specimen and we intentionally uh, put a damage with the probe and we will start now the flashing procedure. Before flashing we have six picometer resolution and the flashing takes around one minute time and after flashing you will see where this uh, specimen damage moves and it actually didn't move anywhere, which means that you don't need to do any alignment before or after flash. If you see that the current is slightly decreasing, you just do the flashing and which you generally do it uh, once a day. Um, and uh, it doesn't bring you any resolution loss. And after flashing, you can immediately start working. So besides the, the uh, Besides the extra brightness uh, cold fact, we also have uh, an S core probe corrective on Spectra 200. This is basically uh, the, the, the patent that uh, we own, coming back to almost, coming, uh, almost now 10 years. Uh, the, I, the advantage of S core is that it corrects really high order aberrations, so fifth order aberrations A5 and C5, and that allows us uh, that we can open up the condenser system and in that way we can go to higher uh, convergence angle which you see here uh, higher than 50 50 milliradians around 40 uh, kb and uh, when you have a large convergence angle that delivers you a better resolution in stem and also better analytics because you have a large convergence angle you have many many electrons coming to your specimen and with those electrons you can generate x-rays you can get eds maps or you can also use uh, these electrons uh, if if there's a filter underneath the microscope to do to do eos experiments as well Another advantage of ESCO is that uh, it is uh, optical stability is improved so that you don't need to tune uh, the corrector uh, frequently now. But, but in principle, what we also have with ESCO is that we have an auto alignment routine. So the corrector software actually takes care of correction itself as well. So you don't need to go to Zemlin Tableau. On top of ESCO, uh, we have Pantage stem detection system. Uh, these are solid state bright field and dark field detectors. Uh, basically, you have a ring detector and as well as a disk detector. Each detector has eight segments, then it makes in total 16 segments. Uh, the, the, the detector geometry is optimized, uh, meaning that, for example, if you look at these four inner segments in the ring detector, the inner over outer radius is exactly one over two which seems to be the sweet spot for ABF stem imaging. So you can use these inner segments for, uh, for, for specifically for ABF stem applications. You can use outer four segments for ADF or HADF, or you can use the whole detector for ADF stem imaging. And the disk detector you can use for bright field stem. 
The advantage of this Panta stem detectors is that we have new amplifiers with it, and it, that gives us um, good sensitivity in very low doses. And we have uh, more than 100 times uh, gain uh, with respect to our previous generation bright field, dark field stack detectors, and also the noise flow is uh, considerably reduced. Moreover, um, for really specialized applications, we have a special arm, um, and that special arm you can put whatever you like. Uh, if you have special ideas, if you have uh, customized uh, experiments, you can use that arm. And also, when you insert and retract these detectors, it comes to uh, the same position, which means that you, when you insert and retract the detector, you don't need to move the convergent beam here and there to, to put it in the center. So it is also quite nice. We talked about um, the, the, the improved uh, signal to noise ratio of the Panther stem detectors. And here are a couple of examples. Uh, what, what we did is that we had an exam, we had a specimen and we just changed the current and we looked at um, how the detectors are performing. And if you look at from three picoampere to less than one picoampere, we can still get very nice uh, line scans. We can still get very nice uh, yeah, uh, imaging performance. And that is thanks to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, low noise amplifiers, uh, which gives us a considerably higher gain compared to our previous generation detectors. IDPC stem, uh, that stands for Integrated Differential Phase Contrast Stem. That's a patented stem image formation technique. Uh, we use it for uh, low Z detection, uh, which I will uh, show a couple of images uh, in the coming slides. Uh, that, that is, uh, the IDP system also gives easy image interpretation. Uh, I mentioned here HADF star contrast, which means that you have um, bright atoms with a dark background, basically. And uh, that is, that, that this uh, IDP system imaging is also quite handy if you are working on high contrast, low dose imaging uh, applications. For example, if you have beam sensitive specimens like uh, zeolites and morphs, uh, IDP system is quite um, quite uh, quite good in terms of imaging, uh, and I, we have a couple of uh, couple of examples coming as well. So how does it work? Um, in principle, you have of course the probe and uh, the Pantel stem detector here, uh, the segmented stem detector, and uh, you acquire basically uh, four images using uh, using uh, Pantel stem detector as if it is a four segment. Se is if it is a segmented detector with four segments, while it has in, in principle eight segments. And uh, from these four images, with a clever um, algorithm, which uh, you can go to this paper and have a look at it, I will not go through it uh, here, um, you can form uh, integrated differential phase contrast image. What does it give you? Um, it provides you a low Z detection. Um, recently, there's, the, the, there's a paper published in Science Advances um, from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. What uh, the researchers did is that they worked on titanium hydride, titanium interface, and slightly far away from the interface, three images were acquired. Um, HADF stem uh, in the middle, IDPC stem, and on the on the right, ABF stem. And if you look at these images, of course, HADF stem doesn't give you a low Z detection because hydrogen doesn't scatter that strongly. ABF stem can give it, but the, the imaging is a bit noisy. If uh, if we compare all these three images, uh, the hydrogen columns uh, are quite clearly observed. Uh, with, uh, with with the IDP system, so the message is that IDP system is really good at low Z detection, and uh, there's no better way to image hydrogen uh, to prove that uh, we can image low Z uh, comfortably with IDP system. IDP this technique is also good for high contrast low dose imaging applications. Um, in this case, that's coming from Tsinghua University from China. Um, what uh, we did is that we acquired two 
two images simultaneously on the left ADF stem and on the right IDPC stem. Basically, because these images were acquired at the same time, the illumination settings are the same, meaning that you have one convergence angle, one acquisition time. So, uh, in theory, the stem resolution should be the same. However, ADF stem is suffering from basically signal to noise ratio here, while IDPC stem uh, delivers a better resolution. In theory, this resolution should be also 1.2 angstrom, but uh, it is it is not because of the signal to noise ratio. And additionally, we did, we can detect also oxygen in this zeolite uh, specimen. Another example, this time a metal organic framework coming from KAUST, uh, extreme low dose, uh, less than 50 electrons per angstrom square. The resolution is around two angstrom. And if we simulate the unit cell structure that fits quite nicely with what we acquired uh, on the, with the IDP system imaging technique. And uh, the last example, again, uh, a different morph specimen this time, this is also coming from KAUST. Uh, this MOF specimen delivers around 1.4 angstrom resolution with the IDPC stem, and this 1.4 angstrom is exactly matching carbon-carbon separation in the benzene rings uh, in, in this MOF specimen. Basically, the carbon-carbon separation is uh, 1.4 angstrom here, which is exactly the same also in graphene structure, um, so that uh, we can resolve uh, this time the benzene rings uh, with the IDPC stem. In terms of EDS detector offerings, Spectra 200 has two flavors. Um, Ram mentioned that we can offer Dulex, uh, which is uh, two race track detectors. They are retractable, they are quite large. Each one is 100 millimeters square and uh, that delivers really high X-ray collection efficiency, which is uh, handy if you are working on beam sensitive specimens. Another option is a Super X. Uh, they are round, four round detectors, each one uh, having a 30 millimeter square surface area. And uh, this is uh, the, the Super X uh, offering uh, could be quite nice if you are uh, continuously working on quantification applications. So what we have covered in this presentation is that uh, we looked at what we have, the important features uh, inside this uh, enclosure. Uh, we have extra brightness cold fact. We have a patented SCO prop corrector uh, correcting uh, high road aberrations. We have our Pantel stem detectors for low dose imaging applications. We have patented IDPC stem imaging for um, low Z detection, high contrast low dose imaging. And also we have two different options for EDS, uh, EDS system, one being Dulex and the other one being SuperX. And we did, with this one, I would like to thank you all and we can move to the questions and answers section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. Just before we get to the Q&A though, we'd like to find out a little bit more about our audience today. So we've got another poll to run. Uh, but do hang around, Anil and Ram. We will uh, go to Q and A after that. We'll also be introducing our extra guest, uh, Dr. Min Wu, who's going to uh, drop in with some of your uh, Q and A as well. So let's get our next uh, poll up and find out a bit more about our audience. So, what is your biggest catalyst imaging challenge? And there's a series of options that you can choose uh, as many of as apply to you, so you can tick more than one box. Is it uh, high resolution, small nanoparticle imaging? Is it beam sensitive materials imaging? Is it a large area imaging? Is it the chemical information that you lack? Uh, or is it something else? And uh, we'll give you plenty of time to get all of those, uh, get your opinions in. Uh, meanwhile, if there are any questions that have occurred to you throughout, then now is a great time to get them into the questions box at the bottom there. We're going to give you a little bit more time. So it's quite exciting as a webinar host. And the reason I'm looking over at this screen is because I can see the answers coming in. And it's a bit like watching a racing bar chart as I can see how things change as more of you uh, get engaged with the poll. So do please get your answers in. It really helps us to get to know uh, who our audience is and it helps us to tailor future webinars so we can make sure that we bring you the information that you need and you will benefit from. Likewise, there will be a uh, exit poll 
as uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, you'll be redirected to an exit poll where you can have your say on the webinar itself. And there's a few extra questions in there from Thermo Fisher Scientific. So do please fill in the exit poll. Uh, we will also attach it to the email that includes the recording and the uh, certificate. So if you don't get a chance to fill it in right now, that's fine. You will get another chance when that email arrives. But it is really useful for us to get to know you, get to know what we've done right, what you'd like to know more about, and so on. That's probably enough time on this poll, so I hope you've all had opportunity to vote. Let's close it down and let's see those results. So uh, the high resolution small nanoparticle imaging, as always, we want to see things smaller and smaller in the highest resolution we possibly can, and that's certainly reflected in these results. But 47% are perhaps lacking the chemical information that you need in terms of catalyst imaging. So thank you ever so much for, for filling that in. Uh, that might also uh, flavour some of the answers that we get to your questions. So it's still time to get those questions in. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's bring Ram back. Uh, I think we've still got Anil anyway, but we'll also now introduce Min. Uh, now, Min, I think you didn't want to have your webcam on throughout the whole Q&A session, uh, but would you mind just turning it on for a second, just to wave so we know that you're still definitely with us? And then we can uh, we can move on to Q&A after that. Okay, hello. Uh, this Hi, is me. Yeah, sorry. I'm sitting in a hotel room, so I don't really uh, want to look uh, too unprofessional. Uh, so, yeah, so, but I'm here. I'm alive. Yeah, I'm a real person, not a robot. Uh, yeah, thanks excellent. very much uh, for uh, for the wonderful presentation, and uh, Ram and uh, Anil. And thanks, everybody, for your attention. Uh, so I'm going to turn myself off, and then uh, we can uh, go on to the uh, uh, exciting Q&A session. Uh, so, um, I have uh, quite a few questions, actually. Um, so, first, we have a question for, uh, for Ron. Uh, so, it seems that you have both in situ and ex situ uh, microscopes. Uh, you have the ETEM, and uh, now you have the brand new Spectra 200 code fact. Um, how would you choose? You know, when would you use uh, in situ TEM, um, and when would you use an ex situ TEM? For, 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 you know, specific uh, catalysis uh, characterization work? Um, that's, uh, that's a very nice question. Um, the the in-situ TEMs are typically used for, uh, for looking at the fundamentally how, how the catalyst works in, in, in understanding the very basics of the catalytic, catalytic processes. So we usually run it on model catalysts, very selected materials, uh, and, and we try to make a model catalyst and, and choose the gas mixtures very carefully, plan the experiment for many months, and then try. And the biggest challenge is to make sure that you're not uh, with your electrons damaging the chemistry in any way. So, so that is a long-term research, and and it is not research that that can contribute to your uh, your quick development projects. So it's uh, it's more fundamental in nature. It takes more time to to commercialize and and uh, and bring it to your customers. Uh, whereas your ATEM, like the Spectra, we can have uh, results. If 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 somebody is making the catalyst in the morning, I can I can look at it in the evening and deliver the results by the next day. Um, so it's very much for very quick analysis uh, of real samples, I would say, the samples that, that go into the customer side, the samples that we sell, and so on. Yeah, thanks very much, Ram. And I have another question, um, a few for actually uh, related to techniques for Anil. Um, so can a monochromator be added to uh, a code fact system? Because we know that normally if we have a, a normal, a conventional XFAC, um, if we would like to reach a very good uh, energy resolution, then we would add a mono to the yeah. XFAC. So currently what we have in the portfolio is uh, an extra brightness cold fact, which can go down to around 0.3 electron volt. Um, and uh, the other option is XFAC mono. And which can go down to considerably lower than that. Uh, we can go down to 25 meter electron volt basically with the XFAC mono combination. Um, um, so it, it it might be possible, um, but it it is um, basically XFAC mono actually delivers 
what you would expect from the monochromated microscope anyway. And uh, the, the cold fake uh, answers quite a lot of answers if you want to go to uh, low KV imaging and um, EELS applications, for example, um, oxidation state experiments. Um, but currently we don't have cold vac monochromator option. Um, yeah, so currently we don't have that. Okay, thanks. That's okay. Um, so we have another question for you, actually. What is the unique feature in Spectra 200? I think we have a lot of uh, unique features. Like yeah, I tried to... Detected. Ah, sorry, sorry. I tried to cover, uh, so basically what we have as unique uh, in the Spectra platform is really the, the, the cold fact, which we didn't have earlier. Uh, we have um, the, our patented probe corrector, which can correct uh, high order versions, which is good for low KV imaging. Um, we have a near enclosure, we have Panther stem detectors for low dose applications, we have IDPC stem, we used to have IDPC stem also in the previous generation, but now we can also couple IDPC stem with Panther stem detectors. And because Panther stem detectors are already good in low dose imaging, coupling with IDPC stem brings an extra kick uh, for, uh, for really being working on beam sensitive specimens. So I would call uh, these ones the really um, new features on Spectra 200. Okay, thanks, Anil. I have a, a question for Ram. Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, you characterize all these uh, this nanoparticles uh, in your catalyst samples, and so what would you consider as a representative number of nanoparticles to get reliable statistics? Uh, we, as a rule, at least count uh, 1,000 nanoparticles. Uh, but that depends, of course, on, on if you have, uh, if, if your catalyst loading is just a few hundred ppm, then your statistics is going to be poor. And, and, uh, and then you, you might have supply results from maybe 50 particles, because that's all you can find in, in a few days' work. So, but as a rule, when, when, whenever it's possible, it's over 1,000 particles. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I also know that uh, for some other cases, you know, it depends on the regularity of the nanoparticles that some some users, some customers would like to see 3,000 or even more. Yeah, yes. can go to very crazy numbers. Uh, yes. Yeah, and it's it's crazy yeah, if you have to click to them uh, manually, you know, it takes a month. Okay, so, oh, I have another question for Ram. The first speaker showed some lithium battery material uh, in the TEM. Mm. Um, it's a question. Um, would you be able to see the lithium columns if you use IDPC technology? I don't know that yet. I, in theory, maybe now now that Anil has shown even we can see hydrogen, maybe we should uh, we should try that. Uh, yeah, I think it But should. I should make sure that the electron beam is not damaging it enough. Uh, but why not? It's something that we have okay. never tried. Yeah, well, I can confirm that uh, we have uh, we have done it somewhere else, and okay. uh, we are able to see the lithium. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> yes, yes. So sorry, I'm selling myself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, right. Another question, actually, for Anil. Uh, can I use my older TM holders with these two different uh, EDS systems, or do they limit the tilt range in in some way? Uh, yes, it, it depends on how old the, 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 the microscope is because uh, we have uh, microscopes coming from the Philips times. Some of them you cannot use the, the ones that we currently use. But if you are a Techna user, um, Talos user, Titan user, Hemis user, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then for the another question regarding uh, the code fact. So, a uh, uh, how often, you know, uh, if I have a code fax system, um, how often do I need to uh, flash the tip, and uh, what is the what is the lifetime? Yeah. Um, so what you can do when you come uh, next to the microscope in the morning, you can flash it, and uh, when you go to lunch, when you come back from lunch, and you flash it again. And uh, besides those, you don't need to flash it during the day. So basically. 
uh, more or less twice but the first one was ba just before starting work start you start working so during the whole eight hours you can flash in the middle which is a lunch break and the lifetime um the the we are well the, the number is that around five years because we don't see why it would uh, it would be problematic uh, for less than five years. Okay, great. Five years. All right. Uh, I um, I have another question. Well, I have to say that sometimes, you know, I get up in the morning and I go to <laughs> breakfast five o'clock in the morning and then I go to lunch at two o'clock in the afternoon. So I probably have to do the flashing in between nine o'clock. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just making a terrible joke. Um, <laughs> I have a question. I have a question for for Ram actually. For a Spectra 200, uh, would you rather have a second alignment at 60 or 80 kV for telesty applications? Yes, we have one uh, at we we chose at 80. Um, for catalysis applications, the one of the I mean. The biggest challenges is um, is you have you have two different kinds of damage mechanisms. You have the the knockoff damage and you have the radiolysis. The radiolysis is much much higher at lower kV, so your nanoparticles do extremely fine at uh, at 80 kV, but then your support seems to disappear uh, because the damage is much faster than your nanoparticles. So, so you have to trade find trade offs, and uh, and we have 80 kV specifically when we are looking at uh, MOS2 and so on. Um, 60 would be better, but uh, we have 80 kV also in our Titan, so we chose with 80 kV. Yeah, that makes um, sense. I, I have to sorry, confirm sorry, with... Sorry to I, jump in, but we are going to yeah. run out of time very soon, Min. Okay, two more questions, yeah? Uh, okay. So I just want to make a, a comment with Anil that uh, we are in Spectra 200, but we do have 60 kV and 80 kV and also 30, 30 kV alignment also available, yeah? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, something you can already uh, relate to, to uh, what we're having as CM, uh, static KV as uh, the most and the highest uh, voltage. And another question for Ram. So uh, you choose a Spectra 200 code fact, but you know that uh, there's also like a Spectra 300 uh, with double corrected system. Uh, like when you were making the decision, you know, why, why did you choose a 200 instead of 300 KV? Um... It's it's a compromise between uh, costs and uh, and what you have, and at some point you have to make a decision. And uh, if you had all the money in the world, we would have gone for the 300 kilovolt, but we didn't. Uh, so we choose the 200 kilovolt, which is the workhorse version of it, and and it's good enough for for everything that we want to achieve. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think we have reached the bottom of the question list. And if there's any question that uh, uh, hasn't been answered, and um, that's because uh, we will get back to you. And um, yeah, thanks uh, very much for everyone's attention. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks uh, to our speaker again, and also the host. Thanks. Um, well, and thank you, Min, for making my job so very easy at the end here. Normally, I, I would be uh, I would be fishing through questions, but you you understand those topics so well that you are exactly the right person to pick those questions out. So thank you ever so much. Uh, as Min said, if there are other questions, maybe they occur to you while you're watching the recording, or it just occurs to you ten minutes after the end, then. Uh, Contact details are on screen now. Uh, we've also shared them in the chat. If you want to grab them before the end of the presentation, then you can. Uh, but that is all the time we have for today. Thank you for sticking with us, even though we've overrun by a couple of minutes. Thank you once again to Min, Anil and Ram for your excellent presentation, your excellent contributions to today's presentation. Thank you to Thermo Fisher Scientific for working with Chemistry World to deliver this sort of content. We know it's important to the chemical sciences community, and so it's really important for us to work with with leading companies like Thermo Fisher Scientific in order to deliver this sort of content. Once again, there is a survey that follows this. Please fill that in now. If you don't get time now, it will arrive in your email uh, when we also send you a link to the recording and your certificate to everybody who attended the live broadcast, just as our way of saying thank you. So a final thank you to Anil, to Ram, and to Min for joining us today, to Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and we'll see you in the next Chemistry World webinar. Thanks very much and goodbye.